Good afternoon, and a warm welcome to the first ever Digital Global Cambridge. I'm your host, Stephen Toop, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. It's great to have you with us. For more than five years now, we've taken Cambridge ideas to locations all around the globe, welcoming local groups of alumni and friends. Now we're bringing Cambridge thinking and expertise to a much wider audience. In fact, this afternoon, we have more than 1,100 people on this call from 64 countries representing all 31 of our colleges. Welcome. It's certainly our biggest ever global Cambridge event and the most truly global. Today, we're gonna to be discussing artificial intelligence and power. First, we'll hear from Dr. Sean O'Haggerty, then Dr. Panta Dahal. First, a few housekeeping points. During today's webinar, your microphones and cameras will be turned off, but you will see and hear our speakers and of course me. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. On the contrary, we welcome your question. You can submit a question at any point. You don't have to wait until the end, simply by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of the page and typing in your question. After our speakers have given their presentations, I have some questions for them, and then I'll open up to questions from you. Now, we're expecting there to be quite a number of questions, probably more than we can actually answer, but we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. This event is being recorded and it will be shared on YouTube next week. Today, I'm speaking from my home in Cambridge where I'm fortunate to be surrounded by books and some beautiful works of art. Outside, the stunning architecture and gardens of Cambridge, a place that's usually buzzing with talent, creativity, and dreams. The ability of human beings to express ourselves through art, through music, and through words is a key factor that we've used to distinguish ourselves from other animals. Our imaginations, it's said, are what make us human. Are they? In 2018, Christie's sold a painting created using artificial intelligence for more than 300,000 pounds. The algorithms behind it could apparently learn aesthetics and it taught itself to paint. If art is the mirror of the soul, is it possible that the reflection created could be soulless? Well, the brilliant Cambridge graduate Alan Turing once said that a computer would deserve to be called intelligent if it could deceive a human into believing that it was human. It seems that we're already being deceived, although we must question whether that is by the machine itself or by the humans who program it. Now, we know that ethical questions swirl around the use of technology to persuade us to do things, to recruit us for work, to replace our jobs, to reinforce or introduce cultural biases. Algorithms ensure that we are bombarded with advertising, with connections, with real and fake news. The internet seems all pervasive. Well, consider this, writing in 1909, incredible, because even private use of landline telephones had hardly begun. Another Cambridge alumnus, E.M. Forster, seemed to predict the internet in his short story, the machine stops. I've been rereading the story during lockdown and I find it extremely resonant. Forster visualizes a world where human beings no longer think they need each other, only the machine. A world where no one interacts, even with family, except through the machine. And where they press buttons to turn on music, hear a lecture, or order items they need. <laughs> it's eerily familiar. Kuno, one of the rare people who rebels against the machine, cries out, we created the machine to do our will, but we cannot make it do our will now. It's robbed us of a sense of space and of the sense of touch. It's blurred every human relation. 
the machine obscures past and present, creating a world where people can learn as they wish, but only what the machine lets them know. In a time before algorithms existed, Forster predicted technology that could reinvent history. Eventually, the machine stops and all its internal civilization dies with it. But Forster leaves the reader with a glimpse of hope. There's a hint of life outside the machine. But the late great physicist Stephen Hawking suggested that, and I quote, full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. It would take off on its own and redesign itself at ever increasing rates. Humans who are limited by slow biological evolution couldn't compete and would be superseded, end quote. Artificial intelligence is powerful indeed. In Forster's story, it's the machine that has the power. But Douglas Adams's creation, Marvin the Paranoid Android, is built entirely to serve. Is this a more accurate vision of the technologies that we're developing? I didn't ask to be made, he says. No one consulted me or considered my feelings in the matter. I don't think it even occurred to them that I might have feelings. Marvin, of course, is ridiculous and a satirical invention. But despite his misery and his brain the size of a planet, he serves his human masters without questioning that such is his role. Fictional portrayals of artificial intelligence are endlessly fascinating, but the reality could be disturbing. Technology is developing at such a speed that it's almost impossible for policy and lawmakers to keep up. The science fiction of Forster's day was still science fiction when I was studying at Cambridge in the 1980s. And even for the youngest adult in this virtual room, smartphones didn't exist when you were a small child and they only became ubiquitous in your teenage years. And yet now we can't imagine our lives without them any more than Forster's characters could imagine a life without the machine. It seems we can no longer live without Wi-Fi, apps, Google Maps, Wikipedia. Yesterday, it so happens that my internet access disappeared for a few hours. I was bereft and increasingly anxious. So we need a cohort of experts, not only to further develop the technology, although that is vital, but to research, analyze, and understand it and to guide those in authority throughout the world. And that's why Cambridge has established the Lieberhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence and the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. These two centers, working in collaboration with faculties and schools, with other universities, with government and private partners, are each exploring the impact of artificial intelligence in our world because we must ensure that the superhuman power that can be wielded through it is used for good. To talk to you further about artificial intelligence and power, I'd like to welcome two leading Cambridge academics. First, Dr. Sean O'Hagerty. Sean is the founding executive director of the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, and he leads its research direction, strategy, and management. His own research focuses on technological trajectories and the impact of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. He'll be followed by Dr. Kanta Dehal. Kanta is the research project coordinator of the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence. Her research is part of the AI Narrative Project exploring the public understanding of artificial intelligence as constructed by fictional and non-fictional narratives. Sean, over to you first. Thanks so much, Stephen. We're all in social isolation at the moment, but life is somehow going on regardless. And actually, AI is a pretty big part of that. Online call technologies like this are using AI to filter out background noise 
and some of them will turn my spoken speech into text if you want that. Supermarkets are using AI for forecasting the demands um, that people will need for logistical planning and for planning routes for drivers so that my elderly neighbors get their groceries. Banks are using AI to detect fraudulent transactions in the masses of payments that are happening online. And like a lot of people, I'm being kept from going mad by Netflix, which is recommending movies to me based on my preference, um, what I've watched before, and what people like me have watched before. In the um, direct response to the COVID crisis, uh, it's been really exciting to see what people have been developing. Researchers in Cambridge and worldwide are developing AI techniques to um, identify disease outbreaks. In fact, one of the earliest signals of an outbreak in Wuhan was picked up by an AI system overseen by epidemiologists right back at the end of December. Um, AI is being um, developed to forecast the needs for equipment and resources in hospitals and to find new ways of diagnosing COVID-19 patients, whether by um, supporting analysis of chest scans or by monitoring um, the sounds that people make when they breathe or when they cough, if they might have the illness. All of this is incredibly powerful for supporting an overstretched medical system. AI is being used to support researchers and clinicians in um, scanning um, for drug candidates. And outside of the lab, AI is being used by um, companies like Facebook to spot and flag online misinformation and conspiracy theories, and a whole lot more. To put it simply, we just wouldn't have been able to respond as effectively to this um, crisis or to keep life going under lockdown as we have without AI and digital technology. So on the next slide, I'd like to ask why uh, this is happening now. The current AI revolution is in large part based around a type of AI called machine learning. Machine learning approaches are statistical approaches that allow computer systems to learn from data and then to make predictions or to take actions guided by the data that they take in. Machine learning is often used in combination with other types of AI um, technique, such as those that make use of collections of human written rules. AI and machine learning in particular um, is very dependent on data, but machine learning in turn allows us to make sense of all this data. Whether through online interactions, health records or satellite imagery, we're generating much, much more data about ourselves and about our world than we ever have before. If we have any chance to make sense of this, to draw out the patterns and the inferences, and to be able to act on all of this data, we need the tools of AI. And at the same time, all of this data makes AI itself very powerful across domains from healthcare to business to the really big challenges like climate change, clean energy, and scientific progress. But as Stephen said, for any powerful technology that um, touches on so many different aspects of our lives at the same time, it's important that we don't just consider the opportunities, but also the challenges and the longer term questions about where this might all lead us. I've been lucky enough to be involved in two centers in Cambridge that do exactly this. On the next slide, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk works on global risk. For AI, this leads us to consider how artificial intelligence can help us with global challenges like climate change, food security, biodiversity loss, and pandemic outbreaks, but also the risks it might pose, whether in warfare or in cybersecurity, or the implications of the more powerful systems we may develop in future. The Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence is a collaboration between Cambridge, Oxford, Berkeley, and Imperial, and considers a much broader range of ethical and societal questions alongside. How do we ensure, for example, that AI doesn't erode our privacy and civil liberties? How do we make sure that we understand the limits of the AI systems we're putting out into the world at the moment and the biases that may exist in the data that it draws on? What can human and animal intelligence tell us about the longer term potentials of AI? And how do our hopes and concerns around AI differ across cultures and ethical traditions worldwide? What can we achieve consensus on and how do we um, reconcile the differences. These are all obviously deeply interdisciplinary questions. They're not just scientific or technical questions. And as a result, our centers have computer scientists working hand in hand with lawyers, social scientists, critical theorists, and philosophers to try and answer them. The Global AI Narratives Project is a fantastic exemplar of the CFI model. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Kanta Dihal, who leads that project and will tell you more about it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sean. So um, as Sean just mentioned, uh, CFI is an interdisciplinary research center focused on the nature, ethics and impact of artificial intelligence. And we're currently running 15 projects divided over five research programs. And uh, the program I work in, which you can see on the next slide, is called AI Narratives and Justice. So I joined in 2017 as a postdoc on the AI Narratives project, where we investigated the portrayals and perceptions of AI in the English speaking world what the dominant narratives look like and how they stereotype the technology, those who build it and those who are affected by it. And we evidence some serious problems in the ways in which we talk about AI now. For instance, when the average person thinks of AI, they don't tend to think of all those technologies Sean just mentioned, but they think of this bloke, the Terminator. So from our research, um, Terminator can, can move on now, uh, emerged a book which came out earlier this year. And since we also had interest from those developing the technology industry and policymakers such as the UK Parliament, we wrote uh, a non-academic report as well. So both are pictured here. And from the start, our research has focused on the extent to which portrayals of intelligent machines are anthropomorphized, made to look like humans, and correspondingly gendered and racialized. We've always argued that this process of biasing and stereotyping creates a vicious cycle when the narratives perpetuate stereotypes. This affects the culture of the industry itself and who is able to work in it. So having a homogenous group of developers means that the technology will have biases that are not picked up on early enough, which leads to inequalities in society, which again becomes reflected in new narratives. But are there alternatives to these stories? Is it inevitable that we imagine intelligent machines this way? Although much AI technology is developed in Silicon Valley, the West is not the only place to ever have imagined the existence of intelligent machines. Comparative research that looks at different religious, linguistic, philosophical, literary and cinematic traditions can make us better understand our own narratives and indicate alternatives. This is why we set up the Global AI Narratives Project. It emphasizes the narratives outside the English speaking West including narratives from countries that have AI technologies imposed on them from outside and rising AI superpowers. In this project, through a series of regional workshops around the world, we're developing a global network of people who work and think in the field of AI narratives in the broader sense. And because of the pandemic, we've had to cancel and reschedule many of the workshops, but I will highlight one we had last year in Egypt. Our workshop in Cairo had a strong focus on the post-colonial and neo-colonial aspects of AI technologies and perceptions. And many of our local contributors claimed that Egypt was a so-called AI desert. There's no development of AI technology ongoing, nor are there any notable films or literature or non-fiction works stemming from the region that portray a future with intelligent machines. So there's a very strong sense that everything is being imposed either from the West or from Japan. But particularly on the Arabian Peninsula, nations are developing their own hybrid of Western technologies and stories with local approaches. And one example is the Ibn Sina robot pictured here, which speaks Arabic. However, not everyone is equally happy with that hybrid. Some call this move self-orientalism, using Western technologies with aspects that the West would consider typically Middle Eastern, such as a robot wearing a tobe in a kufia, or science fiction stories that feature jinns. So on the next slide, we've seen the Global AI Narratives Project is about understanding, platforming and networking. The decolonizing AI project, which I'm currently setting up, is about acting on this knowledge. Now, the term decolonizing is often misused, but it refers to a process of constantly unsettling and questioning the colonial legacy supporting the status quo. 
This can mean enabling people to make the informed decision not to use certain technologies or enabling people to develop their own tools. Because intelligent machines don't have to be the master's tools, the rest of the world has dreamt of them too. This research is far from finished, but it has revealed in surprising ways how powerful storytelling about AI is in different parts of the world as people try to come to terms with the immense technological changes that Sean has mentioned. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kanta and Sean. Uh, really, some fascinating insights, and it's going to be fun to pursue these. I, I'm noticing some great questions already coming in from our audience, and we'll get to those in, in a few minutes' uh, time. Please, uh, those of you uh, online, do submit uh, questions, uh, and uh, we'll get to you shortly. Uh, one of the interesting things for me about AI is that in, in so many ways, all, despite what I talked about in Forster and, and elsewhere, the, the concepts are, are developing so quickly. The technology is emerging so fast. Um, I'm curious as to how you actually got interested in this, because you probably, given your ages, didn't start out uh, in AI. So, uh, Sean, I understand that your PhD was in genomics. How did that transit into uh, an interest in research in AI? We seem to be having a problem with Sean, so uh, we'll try and sort that out and I'll go back to Kanta. What about you, Kanta? Where did your interest in uh, uh, AI really uh, emerge? I gather, by the way, that you have a PhD or you have an interest, I should say, in quantum physics and literature, a wonderful combination. Do, do give us some insight into that. Well, that's quite a long story, actually. Um, I, I began by uh, studying English literature. So I did my uh, undergrad and master's at Leiden University in the Netherlands. But um, I had a semester overseas at uh, UBC in Vancouver. Um, and that's really where everything changed. Now, in fact, uh, the first time I ever met new vice chancellor, um, although you wouldn't have seen me among the thousands of students, but it was at a pep rally at UBC. And this, I gather, was is a North American tradition where basically everybody uh, who's just come into the university as new students uh, gather in the ice hockey stadium and uh, do their school cheers. Um, so we, we did all that. I will not repeat the school cheer for arts that we learned. But then suddenly the lights all went off and it became silent and the Imperial March from Star Wars started playing and there was the Vice Chancellor then of UBC. Um, so aside from, from that uh, close encounter, uh, we, um, so I was able to study anything there during my term abroad. Uh, so I took uh, a course in science and technology studies, um, which was looking at science and technology from a humanities perspective. And I loved it. So I went to st uh, on to um, do my thesis on children's science books and then my PhD at Oxford on quantum physics and literature. Wonderful. Well, I can assure all of our uh, Cambridge alums that uh, we're not going to start playing Star Wars uh, in uh, the Senate House anytime soon. Sean, can we go back to you? Sure. So can you hear me this time? Yes, we can. When I was doing my PhD, the explosion in progress in genome sequencing was just happening. And suddenly we had all of this beautiful data to play with to really start to understand some of the big scientific questions like, how evolution worked at a genetic level. And so I found myself as a biologist having to learn basic programming, statistics, probability, and I was able to make some progress in a rudimentary way, but that got me very interested in what would be the more sophisticated ways that we could deal with this kind of scientific information that um, we are developing, which got me interested in technologies like AI. At the same time, I became very interested in the sheer pace of progress in scientific and technological research. And that brought me to end up reading um, work by another iconic Cambridge person, um, Lord Martin Rees, who wrote this uh, wonderful book, Our Final Century, and uh, another wonderful book on the future. 
where he talked about the big challenges we face, the potential that technology plays in tackling those challenges, but also the um, risks posed and the challenge of trying to um, govern and understand these technologies. I got fascinated by that and went to Oxford to work on it. And a couple of years later, I was lucky enough to be recruited to set up a center to work exactly on these issues in Cambridge. It's funny that that was just seven years ago, but we've gone from basically part-time me to dozens of us at this point working on a lot of the big challenges Martin wrote about, climate change, biodiversity, biotech, and AI. And of course, Lord Rees is a former master of uh, Trinity College and, uh, and uh, really the inspiration behind the creation of the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Sean, you mentioned um, the uh, question around how AI can be used to address uh, the, the fundamental challenges we're facing with the pandemic right now. And one of those methods, presumably, is the use of uh, apps that trace and track uh, how people are interacting uh, with others. Um, I'm curious as to how worried you think we should be about that sort of technology from the standpoint of privacy, uh, government control, potentially, those sorts of issues. How do you think about it? Well, the first thing I would say is that these apps differ in the extent to which they use AI. So um, at least the way that, for example, computer scientists would define them. The UK version, as I understand it, doesn't in any significant way, but they are digital technologies and the issues you raise are very relevant. I think there are a lot of decisions you can make with these in terms of how much data you collect, how you store it, who has access to it, and these are important questions. Uh, I'm pretty happy with uh, what I understand of the UK version, and in fact, the Google and Apple um, version is even stronger on privacy. Um, it, these don't collect a huge amount of information and they've taken good pains to consider privacy and security issues. The UK have even released the source code in a white paper explaining their method, which has allowed the UK privacy um, community to really engage with it. I think these are very good steps in governance. Other parts of the world have deployed apps that draw on much more information such as, for example, your location, your credit card um, usage, CCTV footage. And at that point, I'd be a little bit more nervous. I think that data is a very powerful thing and we should think quite carefully before giving it up. Um, but I also would say that we are dealing with a crisis that is costing us lives every day and it's particularly costing lives of healthcare professionals. Anything that we can do to support them, including through technology, I think we should take very seriously and um, we want to have good reasons to not use that technology at all. Thanks very much, Sean. Very interesting observations. Kanta, anything you'd want to add? Yeah, so regarding the E.M. Forster quote you read out earlier, Vice Chancellor, um, it's, it's really interesting that, again, Forster predicted this idea of what we now call technology creep. So you start using uh, a technology as an emergency solution for a certain situation, um, such as uh, for uh, this specific part of pandemic management, contact tracing. Um, but what tends to happen then is that after that situation is resolved, um, the introduction of the, technolo the technology that has been introduced does not go away. It, mm -hmm stays and it becomes permanent and at some point uh, people just don't notice it anymore. Really interesting. Uh, w there's a, obviously a, an elephant that's right close to us uh, when we talk about AI and that is the question of jobs. Uh, I think the probably the most common concern that is raised by people whenever you talk about AI is somehow uh, we are all going to be replaced by robots uh, or computers. Uh, there won't be any work for human beings to do. Uh, again, uh, I mean, this is clearly a, a huge question socially and economically. Uh, how do you think about that? Is there anything we can learn from existing AI narratives, uh, Kanta, that might help us in, in thinking through those issues? Well, yes, people do tend to focus a lot on the uh, elimination of jobs and nothing coming in their place. Um, 
and uh, resulting unemployment uh, rather than anything alternative that can be uh, created or facilitated uh, by artificial intelligence taking over what we don't like to do. Uh, so there are examples uh, in fiction such as uh, Ian M. Banks's culture novels where um, there is no need to do any strenuous labor um, because that's all been roboticized and taken over by AI. Um, there is much less uh, disease and suffering. And so people find other things to do, ways to enjoy themselves, playing games, uh, traveling the universe. Um, but these stories about the elimination of jobs seem to also sometimes divert attention from the actual uh, roboticization of the workplace where rather than replacing people with robots, companies start using people as if they were robots. So micromanaging their time, putting them under extreme pressure to perform perfectly and flawlessly and um, having their jobs at risk for be for doing such human things as getting sick. Thank you. That's a really interesting observation. Sean, uh, anything you'd like to add? Well, one um, distinction that I would make is that sometimes people think about a full job being automated and thus replaced. I think what you actually will see in a lot more cases is aspects of somebody's job getting automated and effectively somebody being able to produce a lot more. So, you know, everything that if anyone on this call thinks of everything they do in a day, it's very varied, but there are some aspects of it that have repetitive developments that can be automated. So I don't know how many areas would be fully replaced. You couldn't fully replace a doctor, but you might get to the point where one doctor is doing the work that would have taken five doctors in the past. And if you kind of sum that over kind of an economy, that may lead to um, jobs being lost. It will also lead to jobs and new jobs being created. But there are questions underneath that, um, such as will the number of jobs being created be equivalent to those being lost? And will the people who are losing jobs be in a position to gain other jobs going forwards, or will they be for people with new skill sets? But I would also add to that that when I think about this, I always think about there are a lot of things in society that we consider very valuable, but that we don't remunerate. Um, looking after our elderly, looking after children, um, sports and social activities, things that kind of fall outside of traditional economic measures right now. In a world in which we can automate um, some of the routine tasks, why should we not consider um, adding these things to our measures of economic growth? Thanks. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the uh, painting that was uh, sold at uh, Christie's for more than 300,000 uh, pounds. Kanta, you've actually been studying literature as, as a way into uh, understanding how humans interact with artificial intelligence and thinking about the future. Do you imagine a time when writing itself, stories, can be replaced by uh, human creation of stories can be replaced through artificial intelligence? Well, there's two sides to that. So on the one hand, there's of course the kind of um, embodiment and experience of life as a human that is expressed in literature. On the other hand, there is um, the more technical side of writing. So I've had some very interesting uh, discussions with my undergraduates in English, looking at texts that have been written by AIs. And oh. while AI produced poetry can be hard to be to distinguish from human produced poetry. Um, the subtleties of, of producing Longer prose seem far too complex. Basically, um, AI cannot uh, connect sentences in a way that makes sense. Uh, so it can it can produce individual lines that read beautifully, um, and that via vocabulary can sound like they connect. But um, a story we are far far away from. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm about to go to questions from the audience, but Sean, um, just before we do that, uh, obviously there's been a great deal of focus uh, already in our conversation around ethics and AI. 
uh, trying to ensure that AI is actually used to improve the human condition. How do we uh, help governments and other public authorities uh, think about those questions? What, what can Cambridge do? What is Cambridge doing uh, in that space? I think Cambridge is doing um, a lot that's of a lot of value. I mean, one thing is um, recognizing the need for cross-disciplinary expertise on these things. So outside of what we're doing in our own center, I'm really excited about things like the new doctoral training center on AI for environmental risk, bringing together um, researchers working in AI um, and people working on the climate environmental side to really sort of train each other in working together um, for the big challenges and train the next cohort of scientists. I think this kind of work is incredibly valuable. I think the work of centers like the Center for Science and Policy is really important in providing that kind of translational role, linking um, politicians in Whitehall and elsewhere to the um, thinking about both scientific progress and ethical and legal issues um, that's happening in places like Cambridge. Lastly, I think it's really important that um, centers like Cambridge hold um, governments and tech companies accountable to a certain extent. Um, so um, these you know, big powerful players are certainly developing technology um, with all the best of intentions, but um, we have a role to play within that ecosystem to really take an outside view on how things are being developed, bring in the sor sources of expertise we need, consider whether vulnerable communities are being um, included in decision-making processes and so forth, and make sure that, um, yeah, we're holding them accountable. And I guess the last thing I'd say is that Cambridge is a place with a global reach. A lot of the impacts of AI are going to be global, and a lot of the conversations that we need to foster are ones that involve um, talking to our colleagues in Beijing, in South America. Um, we've just released a paper trying to um, look at and resolve misconceptions around differences in AI ethics and governance principles between um, kind of Western traditions and um, Chinese AI principles um, that just came out this week. There's a lot that I think ends up being misunderstood between cultures. And Cambridge, I mean, we've got 64 countries on this call. We have a wonderful opportunity to build those bridges. Great, thanks very much. Boy, we have some wonderful questions, so I'm going to get right into them. Uh, we have a, a question from Nikhil in uh, Singapore, who's a graduate of Hughes Hall. Uh, the, the point is that hypothetically, it's possible for artificial general intelligence uh, to learn ethical concepts from uh, the analysis of human interactions. Is that true? Would AI be able to learn ethics and then apply the concepts in its own interactions uh, with humans and uh, other AI entities. Do we know whether that's possible? Thoughts, Kanta? Yes, um, I certainly think that uh, an AI can learn uh, the way it would be able to learn and infer many things from observing human interactions. I think one thing that we should bear in mind is that it will really depend on which kinds of interactions that AI is observing, because um, everything an AI learns comes from those observations, from gathering data. And so if it sees two people behaving what we would consider less ethically, then um, it has no way of telling whether that is ethical or not. And we'll just infer that that's how humans are. Uh, we have a question from Zheng Yu, who is a graduate of Jesus here in the UK, uh, around just where you ended your last observation, Sean, uh, global, global collaboration, but spinning it around. What about global competition? Uh, there is clearly global competition in the development of AI, especially we see between the United States and China. Europe is involved. Is that good or bad for the ethical use of AI? Sean? That's, it's a very good question and uh, complicated enough that we have a paper on that as well um, um, okay. called an AI race rhetoric and risks. Competition in of itself is no bad thing. I think competition can often spur innovation and AI affects so many different um, disciplines and domains that you can have different countries and different groups within different countries leading in different areas and learning from each other. I think that 
There are limits, though, where competition can get in the way of some of the collaboration we need. I mean, for example, there like, we need some level of interoperability. Um, we are living in a globally connected world, and a lot of our, whether it's our search engines or our self-driving vehicles, are going to be um, crossing borders. I also think that on a, a lot of these kind of ethical challenges, how we use data, how we make sure that AI benefits society, we really do need to try and pool our expertise to the extent that's possible. And I think one of the big challenges we'll have is how to sort of balance the, um, the sort of trade-off, if you will, between um, allowing sort of innovation that reflects um, a particular culture's kind of ethical and um, cultural priorities, while also finding common ground on some things that affect us all on a global level. We have a, a question from Scott in Hong Kong, who's from Keys. Um, whether or not there's a potential that AI will squeeze out or tend to squeeze out minority views, or at, at least make non-conformist views seem more odd. And the, the the question here really comes from assertions that you know Google or Facebook's news supply might be actually. Uh, biased over time because of the patterns of use, et cetera. Does that get self-reinforced? How can that be addressed? Uh, Kant, I'll start with you. Yes, this is a huge problem in all kinds of applications of AI technologies and is one that, again, with uh, COVID-19, we are seeing needs to be addressed uh, again and, and needs to be borne in mind when technologies are developed, where do they gather their data? How is um, a recommendation system built up? Because for instance, with COVID-19, it affects um, men more badly than women. Um, so if you have a database that doesn't take gender into account, then that means that um, some people um, are going to be more at risk than others. Men are going to be more at risk than women. Do you want to add anything to that, uh, John? Um, well, just to reinforce um, comes with you. I mean, there there is a potential for a fundamental problem where certain parts of the world and certain communities have more access to technology and are thus feeding more information and data in, which may um, self reinforce. Um, I think probably the only way, well, there are a number of ways in which we um, can get around that, but we do need to look at, um, carefully at the data sources involved. Um, we need to make sure that there are representatives of communities um, who are likely to be excluded from these conversations, both on the general level in terms of um, what data kind of goes into, um, whether it's Google or Facebook's recommendations, but also the people who are developing the technology. I mean, a lot of this is coming from um, Silicon Valley, which is a somewhat homogeneous group. We need to make sure that voices of communities that otherwise wouldn't be empowered in these conversations have a, um, have a voice in them. I've been quite enthused to see the development of initiatives like the Partnership on AI, which has tech companies, but also has a lot of um, non-governmental organizations, non-profits, who bring in these um, you know, minority views and considerations of vulnerable groups in order to um, do a more nuanced and careful consideration of these issues. Thanks very much. Uh, I've got uh, uh, Irena in uh, France and Eugenio in New York who've asked similar questions around the potential role of intergovernmental organizations. Irena mentions that uh, UNESCO is currently working on ethical principles around AI and Eugenio asks about the role of the UN more, more broadly, I suppose potentially from a regulatory perspective. Is there any a potential in that? Is that how this is moving or, or are these discussions taking place in different fora? Uh, I'll start with you on this one, Sean. I know that the United Nations is uh, taking this increasingly seriously. So a lot of the UN individual bodies have gotten involved in different aspects of AI governance and regulation. UNESCO is a wonderful example. The ITU is another wonderful example. It's been running events and conferences and discussions on AI for global good, um, which uh, have been wonderful presented at a global union, the International uh, Telecommunications Union. Yes, uh, yeah. I apologize. 
Uh, the United Nations centrally has um, recently established a high-level digital panel on global cooperation that's chaired by Melinda Gates and Jack Ma, and um, we, amongst others, have submitted evidence to that. And I'm talking to some of the people involved with that, and I think they're doing very good work. I mean, some of what they're thinking about is how to go from principles. There's been a lot of work done on ethical principles, whether it's privacy, um, security, justice, to the practical application. What happens when the rubber hits the road? Now, that is harder to do than to say because these principles come into conflict with each other and different individual countries have different economic, societal and cultural priorities. So it's going to take, I think, years of careful work to um, figure out how to balance these things. But I do think that the United Nations can play an important role and is doing good work on this. Thanks. Kanta, anything you'd add or? Um, well, the United Nations has also been very uh, supportive in, in building uh, individual and informal networks. So for instance, we launched the Global AI Narratives uh, project at the AI for Good uh, Global Summit in uh, 2018. And uh, we have really been uh, able to use their um, very strong uh, network uh, that is much more non-Western focused than many uh, AI specific networks. Thanks very much. Um, we have a question from Hannah, uh, an Emmanuel grad uh, in the UK, about whether or not uh, public perceptions of AI that you've been describing are going to deeply affect uh, the potential for regulation of AI in the future. How, how do we think about that, uh, both problem and I suppose opportunity? I, again, we'll start with Kanta on this one because uh, uh, Hannah was interested in the narratives you're investigating and how they play out. Yes, yeah, so we have done uh, some research in collaboration with the BBC on uh, this question of uh, what does the UK public think about AI. We ended up uh, giving the paper the title Scary Robot because that was um, an exemplary answer that we got that really represented quite uh, a concerning number of uh, views expressed. Um, basically, uh, many people are strongly influenced by uh, Hollywood, by films such as The Terminator, by TV series such as Westworld. So all about um, humanoid robots rising up and threatening our lives. And yes, that can have very uh, uh, negative impacts for uh, the implementation of AI. Um, Although in terms of regulation, it could also mean that uh, because people are so worried about it, we could say, well, we want very strong regulation of this uh, technology. We want it to be absolutely guaranteed secure. On the other hand, you can get um, over regulation uh, from that. Uh, so meaning that um, regulation will be so strict that the UK will uh, lag behind in terms of uh, development of technologies compared to many other countries. We're almost at the end of our time, but we have one wonderfully provocative question, and you really can only give it a, a, one, a one word answer, I think. And it's a question from Andrew in the UK, who grad graduated from Peterhouse. Could we conceive of admitting a, a, an algorithm or set of algorithms of artificial intelligence as a student at Cambridge? <laughs> What do you think? Yes or no? Unfortunately, we're nowhere near. Not very near. <laughs> and what do you think, Kata? No, absolutely not. I've done uh, uh, admissions interviews for uh, a few years now, and um, just thinking of the amazing range of students that we already get way too many to be able to offer places to, um, I can't think of an algorithm that would get you anywhere near. All right, that's wonderful. Actually, that's in some senses reassuring. I think it's a good way to end. You've been absolutely marvelous. Thank you both for participating uh, and sharing your insights. Uh, it has been just a, a delight to host all of you. I hope that it's been informative and we will look forward to other opportunities. The next Global Cambridge will be in July featuring Professor Robert Miller, 
of the university's Whittle Lab talking about decarbonization of the aviation industry. Stay safe. Thanks for joining us.